April 6, 1917, the United States joins the Great War on the Allies' side. Allied countries were France, UK, Canada, Australia, India, New Zealand, Newfoundland, South Africa, Russia, Japan, Italy, amongst a couple others, versus the Central Powers or Central Empires, which was Germany, Austria, Hungary, Ottoman Empire, Bulgaria, and other small countries. The Great War, or World War I, took place between the years of 1914 and 1918. It was one of the deadliest wars in history. Nine million soldiers dead, 23 million wounded, and five million civilians lost their lives in this conflict that started with the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of of Austria. Woodrow Wilson, president of the United States, would get involved in the war because Germans had these submarines called U-boats, and this was before sonar. You would not know there was a German submarine underneath your boat, and they were just killing innocent people by taking merchant ships out. The United States government promised France it would produce planes to aid with the war effort, just like the U-boat a new technology. War is a lot like racing. It's about finding the unfair advantage and using it against your opponent. Airplanes were a new concept. Remember, 1903 was when the Wright brothers took their very first flight at Kitty Hawk, which wasn't all that long ago. The government needed an engine to power those planes. They wanted a modular design, meaning they could add or subtract cylinders to change engine size and displacements for different applications using the same parts, which would make it more cost effective and easier to mass produce. The Aircraft Production Board, which was headed by Howard E. Coffin and assistant Howard A. Deeds, who owned a pretty good sized stake of Delco. Both Howard and Edward were of Hudson Motor Car Company to set up basic parameters for what would be the Liberty engine. This engine was to be lighter and more powerful than the Rolls-Royce Eagle. The aircraft production board would bring in two of the industry's top engineers, Jesse G. Vincent of Packard and Albert J. Hall of Hall and Scott Motor Company. They were brought in together on May 29th, 1917 at the Willard Hotel in Washington, D.C., tasked with designing an aircraft engine that would rival all of the others. The engine parameters were it needed to be a modular design. The engine had to have a high power to weight ratio and adaptable to mass production. In around two to five days time, the duo would have a complete design drawing for the new engine. In August, the V12 was tested and approved. Three months to design and build a legend. This engine family was a modular design sharing cylinders, valve components, bore and stroke sizes with other engine displacements as well as different configurations. This engine could be made in an inline four, inline six, V8 and V12. Forged steel cylinders with welded on water jackets, single overhead cam on each bank of cylinders aluminum crankcase that was split horizontally making an upper and lower crankcase at the main bearing center line tensioned with through bolts at the bearing bosses water cooled the cylinders extended down inside the crankcase for added rigidity aluminum pistons on floating pins breathing through two and a half inch valves the valve springs and rockers were exposed on this design Starting with the four-cylinder, the four-cylinder was more or less to see if it could be done. Only two examples were made. They were kind of built after the other variant engines were made. They did do some ground testing, but it's unknown if this engine was ever put into a plane and flown. The Liberty 4 was manufactured by Hudson Motor Car Company. 549.8 cubic inch displacement, overhead valve, overhead cam, inline four, nine liters. It's good for 102 horsepower. Bore is five inches and stroke of seven inches. Only two of these were built. The Liberty 6 was produced by Thomas Morse Aircraft Corporation and Wright Aeronautical Corporation. The L6 had a striking resemblance to the Mercedes D3 German aviation engine. 
825 cubic inch displacement, overhead valve, overhead cam, inline six, 13.51 liters. It was good for anywhere between 200 to 215 horsepower at 1700 RPM with a bore of five inches and a stroke of seven inches. Compression was 5.5. 4, 2 to 1. This engine weighs 567 and a half pounds dry. Twin updraft carburetors, 52 of these six cylinders were built. The Liberty L8, also known as Packard 1A 1100, which if you think about it, this would make Packard one of the first companies to make an overhead valve, overhead cam, V8. This was also an experimental engine. Only 15 units were produced. It's worth mentioning, Packard hand-built one of these V8s before ever building a V12. 1,099 cubic inch displacement, overhead valve, overhead cam, V8, 18 liters. It's good for 290 horsepower at 1,200 RPM. With a bore of 5 inches and a stroke of 7 inches, this engine weighs 575 pounds dry. Liberty L12, aka V12, the War Department placed an order for 22,500 Liberty V12 engines. They would divide that contract between Ford, Marmon, Packard. There was some drama with Henry Leland and Billy Durant. Leland was the founder of Cadillac, wanted to build engines under contract to get some of that government contract money. Durant was a pacifist, and he didn't want nothing to do with war effort or building anything for the government. So Henry Leland just quit GM and started Lincoln to build the Liberty V12 engine. Durant would eventually build Liberty engines as well. So the contract was divided amongst six companies, Ford, Marmon, Packard, Lincoln, Buick, Cadillac. Fun fact, Ford was responsible for producing the cylinders for the engine. Ford would build all of the cylinders produced, which was 433,826, as well as 3,950 completed engines. 13,574 engines were built before the war was over. They were still being produced after the war with a total of 20,478 units in two years from 1917 to 1919. 1,649.3 cubic inch displacement overhead valve, overhead cam, 45 degree V12, 27 liters. It's good for anywhere between 400 to as high as 450 Horsepower at 1,800 RPM, 730 pound-feet at 1,800 RPM as well. Bore of 5 inches and a stroke of 7 inches. Compression is 5.4 to 1. Dry weight of this beast is 844 pounds. This engine was designed for aircraft, but it would find use in other applications such as tanks and boats such as the NC-4. The Liberty engine wasn't all rainbows, unicorns, sunshine, and bliss. It had its flaws. The 45 degree angle of cylinders wasn't the ideal angle for a V12. It raised a lot of questions about torsional vibration. The V12 crankshaft experienced severe torque peaks between different RPM ranges. Broken crankshaft was a common problem for these engines. A lot of early engines wouldn't even survive the 50 hour acceptance test. Burnt exhaust valves, accessory gear failures are all common issues of this engine. After the war, these engines were sold for pennies on the dollar, being used in everything from cars to boats, hot rodded of course. By 1924, 11,810 L12s were still in inventory. In the late 30s, a new world conflict would take center stage. Packard would play a huge role in building the Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, one of the many unsung heroes of World War II. The name alone gives me the chills. But as they say, that's another engine episode for another day. All right, now it's time for Would You Rather a Bit Different today. If you can have any engine besides the V12, which one would you go for? Would you go for the four-cylinder, the six-cylinder, or the V8? What application would you use the engine for? Would you put it in a car slash truck, a plane, or a boat? I'm interested to see what you guys come up with in the comment section below. Now it's time for Name That Tune. First person to get both the name of the band and the song title correctly in the comment section will have their comment pinned to the top of it. 
Thank you all so much for coming out and watching this. If you'd like to get in touch with me, shoot me a comment in the comment section below or check out our Facebook group that correlates with this YouTube channel. Anything car related is a go on there. If you don't have Facebook and would still like to reach me, send me an email. All of it will be linked in the description below. Just know I appreciate everything that you guys bring in the comment section. And until next time, toodaloo! She also told me stay away cause you never know what you'll catch.